morning, everyone. Let's open our Bibles to Ephesians 6. As you guys haven't heard yet, it's Father's Day. So, amen. Uh, how many believe we got a good father up in heaven? That's the ultimate father. That's who we look to. I was just thinking of how blessing, how much of a blessing it is that we can just be here to worship God together. Um, you know, it's the body of Christ together in fellowship. And it's just such a blessing. But um, let's look at these first four verses of Ephesians 6. That's kind of the, the main part of the message this morning. It's called Children and Parents is how it's titled in the ESV right here. And we'll talk about the titles in a little bit. Um, but let's just first talk about children and parents, talk about fathers and stuff. So let's read through this. So children, obey your parents in the Lord, for that is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and the instruction of the Lord. So that's going to be the main part of what we're going to talk about today. And then how do we do that? That's going to be the main thing after that is how do we do the, that there? So let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer and then we'll discuss this uh, passage here. So Heavenly Father, just thank you for today, Lord. I just thank you for uh, blessing us so much with things that we don't deserve, God, such as your grace, your mercy, and just everything that you've given us, God. I pray that we don't take it for granted, but every day we just thank you, Lord, for every single thing you've done for us, God. That we look for you in everything, Lord, and most of all, we look for you in your scripture, that we get into your word, God, and just see that you're the good father, that you're just full of grace, you're full of mercy, that you sent your own son to die for us, God. And I just pray that it's not me speaking this morning, Lord, that it's your word completely, you, God. Um, just help us this morning to have ears to listen <clears throat> and just open up our hearts, God. Open up our eyes this morning, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So, verse 1, children, obey your parents in the Lord for that is right. So, we see two ways in this relationship right here, right? So, we got children, then we got parents. So, children, and, and I think everyone here would agree that we're a child of someone, right? I mean, otherwise, how do we get here? Uh, so, we're children, and it says, obey your parents in the Lord for that is right. That's one of the great commandments, or one of the Ten Commandments, right? So if you look at that, it says, honor your father and mother, verse 2. It repeats the commandment. Honor your father and your mother. This is the first commandment with a what? With a promise. So um, Paul's talking about this is the first commandment with a promise. What's that promise? It's verse 3. That it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. Right? So think about this. How is that so? Now God blesses you, of course, but think about this. Um, fathers, do, do you want what's best for your kids? So when you tell your kids to do things, it's, you know, wear this helmet when you ride the bike. Why do they wear the helmet when they ride the bike? So when they fall, they don't get hurt. What's the worst thing that can happen? They get a concussion or, you know, the worst thing that can happen is they die. So you want what's best for your kids. So it, it, from the child's perspective, when you look at your parents, they really, most of the time, hopefully, want what's best for you. Now, obviously, they got the flesh. We could talk about that in a little bit. But they want what's best for you. So listen to your parents. Obey your parents. When they sit there and say, don't go to college and party and have premarital sex, do you think they want what's best for you? Yes, they do. Right? You guys can interact here. You can say amen if you agree. You know? So it, they, they want what's best for you. So when, when Paul, what he's saying here is the promise here, it may go well with you in the land. Because if you listen to your parents, they want what's best for you. And they want what's going to help you live for a longer life, a good life, right? Now, how many realize that we have a heavenly father as well? If you follow him, and how many realize that he gives commandments because he wants what's best for you? Do you see the pattern there? Except he's a good father. He's perfect. You know, we fathers here on earth aren't perfect, but he's perfect, the one above. So when he gives us a command, he wants what's best for us. He wants you to do well in life. We just need to listen and obey. What's so hard about that, right? But just within your earthly fathers and your earthly mothers, children, obey your parents so that it may go well with you. For this is what is right. That's what it's saying here. Now, verse 4 talks about fathers. And I think, you know, in some ways you can think of mothers here as well. But fathers, do not provoke your children to anger. Right? And I got this list here. This came from um, Chuck Swindoll. I'm reading through something here, and what does it mean to provoke your children? So he has quite a list here, so you know this doesn't come from me. But unreasonable demands for perfection. Do we see that from parents from time to time? 
that might be provoking your kids. Because can your kid live a perfect life? There's only one who can live a perfect life. You know, I think so many times people hear I'm a Christian, they hear I'm a pastor, and they expect perfection. Does anyone ever hear you're a Christian, they expect perfection from you? It's like, I can't believe he did that. He's a Christian. It's like, you know what, we follow a perfect God, and we want to do that. But thank God I don't have to be perfect. If I had to be perfect, I wouldn't be saved. I don't have to be perfect. Christ is perfect for me, and God sees his righteousness. Amen? But us as fathers, why do we demand so much perfection from our kids? I, I have, I have a, a, an idea. Why do we demand so much perfection from our kids? Is it because we don't want to be embarrassed? Think about that. We, we got our own pride in there, right? Mijo, go win the race so I can look good. Sorry, that's not the Renato coming out of me right there. You know what I'm saying? Mijo. So unreasonable demands for perfection. Another one, constant nagging over minor infractions. Things so small. You think the kids realize, like, Dad, it's not a big deal. Why are you making such a big deal out of it? And we begin to provoke them. And we're, this is going to lead up to something. Here, don't, don't worry. There's something that, you know, we should be thinking about something else more important than minor infractions. Who should we be thinking of that's more important than minor infractions? Who's more important, guys? God. There's a pattern here. Um, what about this? Lack of encouragement and affirmation. We don't encourage the kids anymore. Well, you didn't win the game. You didn't win the race. You didn't do what I wanted to see done. We don't encourage them. You know, it's like I, I heard a dad, we're, co- we're doing soccer. I wasn't coaching. Max is, was coaching, bless his heart. And uh, there was a dad out there, and he was just like sitting there. We lost the game. He's like, they just want to hand out participation trophies to everyone. And he was yelling at the ref and everything. And he was upset that we want to tell our kids good job even though they lost. I don't know where he is with Christ and everything, but, you know, I'm talking about the parent, not Max. I know where Max is at, so don't worry there. Um what about harsh, unloving rebukes or cruelty? Do we sometimes just lash out at our kids? Do parents ever lash out at their kids? You know, and if you're a kid right now and you're not a parent, realize, you know, these, these, this goes with other things, you know? Are we treating other people this way? What about public embarrassment? Do we humiliate them in public? Oh, they humiliated me. I'm going to come and get them too. You know, I know some parents like that. It's like, if you're ashamed of me, I'm going to walk you to class. I'm going to make sure I'm going to let every kid see you on the way, right? We, we just, we'll, we'll shame them in public. We'll whip them in public. We'll do everything in public. We'll make them look bad in public. And do you think that's going to provoke them? Is that going to make them think certain things and, and begin to kind of, you know, maybe not, just start to dislike you as a parent and want to, the first day I can get out of the house, I'm gone. Uh, verbal or physical abuse. Um, what about inconsistent discipline? I, I think it's funny. A lot of times we want to discipline when they embarrass us, right? You shamed me. I'm getting you good right now. We don't let it, you know, we don't sit there and pray about it. We don't think about it. We, we just, you know, that was it. I looked bad and I'm going to make sure you, you pay for it. Uh, showing favoritism for one child over another. Do parents ever do that? I, I don't think any parent. I don't know any parents that do that. They favor one child over another. But that's provoking. An unfair or extreme discipline. What about this one? You guys are going to kind of get me here. But what about overprotective hovering that stifles growth? I don't know. I read this off a list, so we can blame Chuck Swindoll. But overprotective parenting. You get so much to the point, you know, eventually they got to see it. Eventually they got to see the world. And they're going to see it for what it is. But if we sit there and just over just all the time, just over them, and they don't feel any sort of freedom whatsoever... In any way, I know we've got to guide them and lead them. And we're going to talk about that next because that's what this verse says right here if you read the bottom of it. But, you know, we sit here, we provoke the kids. What do you think? If you keep provoking your kid, you keep choking them out and just keep getting them and getting them and getting them and getting them, what's going to happen when they grow up? Do you think they're going to want to follow and obey you? They don't, they're, they're done with you. And that perfect God you told them about, what do you think they're thinking of him? We got to model him. Does God discipline? Yes, he does. Praise God, he disciplines. Otherwise, I wouldn't be up here today. I mean, that's just reality. We have a God who disciplines. We need to discipline the kids. But do we need to love them and show mercy and show grace? We, we do, right? Look at this. Our ultimate goal as a father is that we should be pointing them to the real father in heaven. That should be everything that we do. Mother, same thing. Point them to God. 
I, I heard a pastor um, online on Facebook, and I always say don't go on Facebook, but there I'm on Facebook. This pastor says, he says, you know what I did with my kids was I tried to train them to listen to the Holy Spirit. They come to me and, you know, for discipline, whatever it may be, he told them a passage, I want you to go read this and come back and tell me what God tell, told you. He tried to train them in a way to, to point them to God, direct them to God. What is God telling you? What's the Spirit telling you? Now, obviously, he's not just saying go by your feelings. He pointed them to Scripture. But he had them read it, had the, the Spirit speak to them. And, and that's the goal as fathers. Can we get them to God? Instead of just beating them silly and beating them to the point where, where they're just tired of it. And look at verse 4 right here. This is, this is the goal here. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but, but, what should we be doing? But, says something here, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of who? Of the Lord, of God. That's what we should be doing, right? So we shouldn't be sitting there provoking them. We need to bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. So what does that mean? Well, what's God's will for your child's life? Think about that. And grandparents, if you, it's, it's not too far. If you got an adult child, it's not too far yet. You, you can still point them to God. It's a little bit later. We'd like to start younger, but don't stop. But what does God want for your child? What does God want from you? He wants you. What, what's the chief? What's the main purpose of man? Uh, I thank Ethan for pointing me to this book. I've been going through it with the kids, and it, it's the, one of the catechisms right there from Westminster. And, and the first question is, what's the chief end? What's the purpose? What's our primary purpose? And this whole week, we started this last week, we just grinded it down just for the whole week with the kids, to enjoy and glorify God forever, to enjoy God. You realize God wants you to enjoy Him? And they backed it up with Scripture. We could look at that Scripture, but God wants you. How do we get to enjoy God? We taught them, that the, the book said, it's like a flower. How do you guys, how do you guys enjoy a flower? You got to stop and smell it, right? Just got to stop and smell the roses. We heard it, right? We got to spend time with God. So that's something we need to do. We need to make sure our kids are spending time with who? With God, with the Lord. How do we teach them to do that if we're not doing that ourselves? Right? So we got to model that. So we got to get them going. We got to bring them out the instruction. What's something else God wants? He wants your love. He wants your relationship. He wants you to know Him. But without what? We can't please God without faith. We got to start teaching our kids to trust God, to have faith in God. That's the ultimate goal. Are they going to go through trials? Are they going to go through tribulations? Are they going to go through hard times? Yes. That's just life. In the midst of all that, we need to teach them to have faith. How do we do that if they don't see that in us during the trials, and during the tribulations? Amen? So we got to be living our lives with faith. Now this sounds perfect, right? That's like a perfect world. This is what we need to be doing. Paul's saying, guys, Goals, right? If, if Paul was in this time, he'd post this on Instagram, put hashtag goals. This would be our goals right here. We want to see this in our parenting. This is what we want to see. Guess what he talks about right before this? He talks about wives and husbands. Think about that for a second. So we got another part of the family, wives and husbands. And he says, wives, submit to your husbands. And, and husbands, love your wives as Christ loves the church. Doesn't that sound great? How many want a marriage like that? How many of us want a marriage that, that, that is practical? It doesn't mean we're going to have a perfect marriage. You realize in a marriage, you got two people. You got the flesh of two people working against you there. But, but Paul, is talking about, Paul is talking about right here, we want to see this kind of marriage. We want to see a marriage where wives are submitting to the husbands. A, a marriage where the husbands are loving the wives as Christ loves the church. That's a whole different level when you think about that one. And I'm not going to dive so much into the marriage but I want to point out there's three relationships he talks about here. So the first one in chapter 5, verse 22, is the wives and the husbands. So does anyone have a physical Bible on them? Praise God if you do. I used to use the digital one, but the physical one, you're going to see the way this is laid out, and you're going to be blessed this morning. The digital one, hopefully you can follow along, and I'll try to describe it to you. But, but right here in this section, I'll just point it. There's wives and husbands. The next one is the fathers and the children, right? So we got the parenting. And then the next one is the bond servants and masters, you know, the slaves, but it's a little bit different than what we think of slaves. Think of that as the workforce, you and your boss, okay, for, for our application. We're not going to go into the details of that. But three relationships, you guys with me? So what's the first one? you got the husband and the wife. First relationship, right? And I think everyone here would love a great marriage. And Paul would love for you to have a great marriage. And then the next one is children and parents. Do you want a good relationship with your kids? I mean, I, I can't believe it. 
how much I love my children when, when they're bored, but now when they're right there, like, dad, 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 it's just like, I need some space. Just give me some time here. Please, son. So, so we got that relationship, but we also have another important relationship. We got the work-based relationship. And we all have a perfect relationship with our boss, right? We agree with everything he does, and we, we just completely, you know, just want to glorify God through our relationship with our boss, right? Or with our employee. Nothing's wrong there. So um, those are three relationships. Now, it, who, who wants, it, this morning, who wants a good relationship with your, your spouse? Who wants a good relationship with your kids? Who wants a good workforce relationship? I count of five people. Praise the Lord. The rest of you, I really hope you want a good relationship with some of these, right? So who wants, I mean, honestly, who wants a good relationship in all three of these areas? Amen, right? We want a good relationship in all these areas. Paul wants you to have a good relationship in all these areas. God wants you to have a good relationship in all these areas. I want you to have a good relationship in all these areas. And then guess what? How are we going to do it? Because I can try on my own. I can try in my flesh. Has anyone else tried in their own and in their flesh and you just failed? You've been there. We've been there, right? So God wants this from you. But guess what? Right before this, Paul talks about God is going to be there to help you with it. Do you guys realize that? Let, let me explain that really quick. You guys heard about the Holy Spirit. Jesus says, I must go because I got to send someone else. I got to send the helper. The one like me, who's not going to just be walking alongside you like Jesus did, right? But who's going to be what? Inside you. I'm going to come inside you. And I'm going to help you with these things. Realize that's what Paul's talking about. So this Bible right here, you guys see the titles. Do you guys know that Paul didn't write those titles? We say they're not inspired. They're, they're, the, the, whoever translated it, they put it in there to help you just know the sections. Do you guys realize that means that all three of these sections was just one letter. In the section before it was all part of the same letter. You can just get rid of it. You know the verse numbers also the same thing are not inspired. They weren't written there. It wasn't like Paul wrote, okay, verse 2, verse 3, verse 4, next verse. Those that came in later, because guess what? If I was talking about Ephesians 6 and we didn't put the verse number, you guys have no idea where I'm at. I'm be like, well, go to page so-and-so and somewhere, you know, 21st paragraph in the book or wherever it's at. We're going to be lost. So, so they have their purpose. They have the reason. What I'm trying to tell you is that the way it's written is it's all one letter. It all goes together. So what Paul talks about right before these relationships has everything to do with these relationships. And check this out. Verse, chapter 5, verse 18. If you're with me right here. Chapter 5, verse 18. This is the power. If you want to have a good relationship with your wife, you want to have a good relationship with your kids and your parents, you want to have a good relationship at work, this is where the power comes from. It's chapter 5, verse 18. Check this out. And do not get drunk with wine, for that's debauchery, but be filled with the what? The Spirit. That is who is going to help you with these relationships. Amen? So if you want to have a good marriage, what do you need to be filled with? If you want to have a good relationship with your kids, what do you need to be filled with? If you want to have a good relationship with your parents, who do you need to be filled with? If you want to have a good relationship at work, the Holy Spirit, you guys get in the pattern yet? That is the power that's going to help you in these areas. So let's take a look a little bit at that passage. Let's go back just a little bit to verse 15. I mean, if we had time, we can go way back because, like I said, everything leads up. Everything has to do with it. Uh, I mean, you could see, like, the way Ethan's going through Colossians. The reason why he goes verse by verse is because this all relates. This all builds up. This has everything to do with the next passage. So this has everything to do with your marriage, everything to do with your family. So look at this. Verse 15. Look carefully, then, how you walk, not as unwise, but is wise. Now think about this. Look carefully as you walk. What, what could go wrong? If I'm walking, what could go wrong? I'm a clumsy person. What could go wrong? And I got cables here, you know? And I always set one up that goes across. You guys probably think I'm trying to trip past them when I'm not. All right. But, you know, they're, they're all here. So I got to just be careful with that. But you got to be careful how you walk because you can trip. You can stumble. You can fall. You know, it, it doesn't say be careful how you run. I, I'll tell you what the American lifestyle. Think about the American si lifestyle. Is that a walk or is that more of a run? Man, I got done with the spring, and finally, we, we get to summer break, and I'm sitting there, and I got this long list of stuff I got to get done. And I'm sitting there, I'm looking at it, and I'm like, whew, I don't feel like doing anything right now. I'm gassed out. Why? Because it's like from soccer practice, we got BMX, and then from BMX, I got to go to work, and then we got church, and then we got this, we got that, and, and guess what's going on? We get so busy with our lives that we're not even focused on our walk. Is anyone else doing that? Maybe. 
And we got to stop, and we're going to look at that verse 16. So we want to walk, or verse 15, not as unwise, but as wise. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. Verse 16, making the best use of what? Time. Man, if we're failing in America today, it is time. We do not spend time with our kids. We do not spend time with our spouse. We do not spend time with who? The Lord. And look what it says, making the best use of time. To me, the best use of time is just about everything else for the wife, kids, and God. Is there something wrong with that? There's something wrong if we sit there and we think that the that, that, that time with all these other things is more important than my wife, more important than my kids, and more important than God. God up above all the others. And Paul's talking about that, that because the days are evil, the days sit here and they want to distract you. The days sit here and they sit on your cell phone and they say, spend hours with me. The days sit here and they're on the television these days saying, spend hours with me. Waste away your life. Waste away everything you do. Walk not as the wise. That's what the world, that's what America is telling you today. But is that the truth? What's the truth? We need to be careful how we walk and we need to use our time wisely. Does time have anything? Does it affect those three relationships? Does it affect your husband and your wife? I'm reading a book right now. I think it said somewhere, I forgot. It was under like 10 minutes, the average amount of time that the husband and wife spend together. Quality time, alone time. I'm not talking about, you know, with the family. I'm talking about just your husband and wife, just you and your wife, you and your husband. How much time do you guys spend together? And how much time do you spend together in God's word? And what about your kids? I I was reading the same book says that the average dad spends less than 15 minutes a day with their kids. This was written in the 90s. This is before cell phones. The average dad, less than 15 minutes a day with their kids. And we wonder what's wrong. Look at that. That affects your relationship with your wife, with your spouse, your wife. I said wife and spouse at the same time. Oh, wow. So, but anyways, with your children, your parents, your your at work, everything. Verse seventeen. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. What's the will of the Lord? Once again, to spend time with Him, to obey Him, trust and obey, have faith in Him. That's the will of the Lord. But we don't want to make the time for it. We want to make the time for every single thing else. You know what your thing is. I can't sit here and keep listing things out. And therefore, do not be foolish. Realize the fool says that there is no God. That's what Psalm 14 says. The fool says there is no God. When we live that lifestyle, we're living a foolish lifestyle. We're living a lifestyle that says there is no God. So we need to start spending time with God. And look at this. This is the part. And do not get drunk with wine. Realize Paul's talking about getting drunk already. When you are drunk, how do you walk? See, there were three things. There was the walk, there was time, and there was being foolish. He talked about those three things right before this. When you were drunk, how do you walk? Well, I was watching this video, and I shouldn't be watching these videos, but the cop takes this person out for a DUI test, and they have them walk, and what do you think the person does? They fall because they're drunk or they're high. Whatever it may be, whatever we want to call it, we encourage that these days apparently, sadly in America, legalize everything, let's do everything. It's not wrong. It is wrong if it keeps you from the Lord. And they walk and they walk and they walk and they stumble. So if you're drunk, you're going to stumble. If you're dr- you realize you can get drunk on things other than beer? You can get drunk on things like pornography and, and, and just binge watching television and shopping and And you can fill your life, basically anything you fill your life with other than God is going to cause you to stumble, just like a drunk man. Oh, oh, what about time? Is is alcohol affect your time? How often do we see drunks spending hour after hour in the bar? But the same thing, all those other things are listed. A waste of time. It's a waste. And it's foolish. How many drunks do you talk to? And the things they say just sounds wise. Like, wow, man, that is wise. I've seen people who smoke weed do that. Like, wow, I never thought of that before. And it's like, you both sound like idiots. I'm just going to be honest. Even when they're sober, they sound like idiots because it still affects them when they're sober. Because you're letting the devil in their life. Because they're not filling their life with the things of God. Guys, I want to make sure something's clear. At Trinity Baptist, we tell you not to drink. 
Not because we want to judge you. If, if someone's telling you that, that they, they don't want you to drink because they want to judge you and tell you they're better than you, then shame on them because that's not the goal. At, at Trinity Baptist, I mean, we, we, want to, we want to make sure you don't do these things because we want you to be filled with what? With the Spirit. Because if you're filled with the Spirit, then you, you become complete with God. You begin to have joy in your life. You get to have that fullness. And then your, your, your marriage starts to go better because you're filled with the Spirit. And you, your relationship with your kids and your parents starts to go better because you're filled with the Spirit. And then your relationship at work, be, be, you know, with your boss, you begin to be submissive and all these other things. We want what's best for you at Trinity Baptist. And that's why we say don't drink. It's not a legalistic lifestyle. Praise God that, that you're not saved by works. We're not trying to say you're saved by not drinking. We want you to be living a blessed lifestyle like we read here in Ephesians chapter 5 and 6. And that's why we say don't be filled with those things of the world, but be filled with the Spirit. It's one or the other. So what are you doing with your time? Are you spending it with the Lord? Or are you spending it with all these other things? Are you filling it with God? Or are you filling it with these other things? And, and I have this illustration for you. I was just thinking about this. You know, you're, you go to the doctor and anyone got any heart problems here? You, you know, and it's, it's, they tell you and the doctor's like, you're overweight and, and you need a quadruple bypass and you just, you do keep clogging your arteries and you got your arteries filled. So what do they tell you to do? What do the doctor tell you to do if you got some heart problems? They probably just give you pills these days, but what else do they tell you to do? Change what? Change your diet. Then stop eating that steak, right? What, what about a diabetic? If you were a diabetic and you're always feeling sick and you're always feeling lousy, would you want to know you're a diabetic? You'd probably want to know, right, so you can fix it. And some of us don't, right? But, but we want to know, so you know, that's the problem. So, so you would probably want to get that blood test. You'd probably want the doctor to tell you, hey, you got diabetes. I'm sorry, but you know what? If you start, if you quit the sugar, you start eating a little bit different in your lifestyle, things are going to begin to feel better. And if you don't, you're going to start losing your toes and your, your fingers and you're going to die. And how many of us are like sitting there? I was like, I don't like that doctor. I'm gone. And you find a new doctor and they tell you the same thing. You're like, why are they? They're just rude because they got their MD and they just think they're above everybody. When is it? We're going to humble ourselves and be like, you know what, doctor, you're right. I'm going to change my diet. You know what, doctor, you're right. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to stop eating that sugar. I'm going to stop eating that sugar. I'm going to cut it back. I'm going to do what you say. I'm going to live a healthy lifestyle so I, I can live long and I can be with my kids. I can be with my wife and I can do the things. Don't you realize that's exactly what Pastor Moore does when he gets up here and he tells you live this lifestyle, not that? Because he's not, he may not be looking at your physical being, but he's looking at your spiritual being. And he's saying, I want you to have a blessed relationship with your spouse. I want you to have a blessed relationship with your kids. Therefore, don't be drunk with wine. That's why we don't want you to drink. And, and I guess that's drunk. And we can sit here and debate on whether you should have a little bit or have a lot or wherever, you know, sit there and how should we write it in our bylaws and all that. But in the end, how are you using your time? Are you filled with the Spirit? Because I'll tell you what, once you're filled with the Spirit, you realize that's all I want. All I want is Jesus in my life. All I want is God in my life. And I don't want anything to do with that. But do you think the devil's happy about that? No. So there's always that battle of the flesh. So before we continue, I want to talk about another thing. But I want to um, finish up. Here's the results of the Spirit. And we've got one more place to go after that. But what's the results of the Spirit? Check this out. Verse 19. So if you got the Spirit in you, let's move on to the next verse. Verse 19. So addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. So think about this for a second. If you're filled with the Spirit, this is the result of being filled with the Spirit. And I know I talked about obedience is worship or, or worship is obedience. It's more obedience is worship. We've got to be careful in the way we word that. But there's another way of worship. Notice if you're filled with the Spirit, what are you going to be filled with? Song, joy, right? It says right there, making melody uh, to the Lord. You're going to be filled with that joy. You're going to be addressing each other with song. And, and you're going to be making melody to the Lord with your heart. And that, believe it or not, is, is across the scriptures. But we're good Baptists. We just sit there with a blank face while the worship goes. But check this out. Psalm 40. Look at Psalm 40. I didn't hear amens on that one. I'm sorry. <laughs> Heard Carlos. Amen. Amen. Look at Psalm 40. It's real quick, and, I, and we'll have it up there. Uh, I went to Job. Let's, let's, get over to, let's get over to Psalm here. Isaiah. There we go. Pastor doesn't know his Bible. I should have bookmarked it. You guys are beating me there. Here we go. Psalm 40. 
I waited patiently for the Lord. Does, does that take time? Think about those three things earlier, right? That we had the foolishness, we had time, and we had the walk. Think about this just for a second, okay? I waited patiently for the Lord. Does that take time? How many of us wait patient, or do we just say a prayer and we move on? Like he didn't answer it and done. I gave God some time. I waited patiently for the Lord. And after waiting patiently, after the time, he what? He inclined. He stooped down. He, he inclined his ear to me. He listened to me and heard my cry. In verse 2, he drew me up from the pit of destruction out of the miry, blo- uh, miry bog and set my feet upon a rock, making my steps secure. If your steps are secure, how's your walk going to be? It's going to be secure as well, right? It's going to be a good walk. So who helps you with your walk? Jesus, God, right here, it says it. He did it. And look at verse 3. This is the part I wanted to get to. So you're filled with the Spirit. You start seeing these things. You start spending time with God. You, you start walking good. And then right here, verse 3, He, He, He put a new song in my mouth. When you get filled with the Spirit, He puts a song in you. And you start singing it. You know, I don't know why I picture Paul being like tone deaf. Like, you know, that guy that just can't sing, but he doesn't care and he sings it anyways. I'm talking about the Apostle Paul, not, not, not our other Paul. Okay, so Apostle Paul. All right, I saw him look up and I was like, I got to be careful here. So we got Apostle Paul. So he's singing and, you know, we, we know with the Philippian jailer, they're singing him. So Paul, he's talking from experience. David, another great man of God, talking from experience when he's got God in him. I mean, upon him, just surrounded by him. God puts a song inside my heart and I begin to sing it. Do we have a song in our heart this morning? Are we spending time with God? Are we being foolish? He put a new song in my mouth, a new song of praise to God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. Man, it witnesses to others. You guys should grab a bag on your way out. Put a song, turn a praise song on and start filling those packages so we can witness and help others see. In verse 4, look at this. Blessed is the man who makes the Lord his trust, who does not turn to the proud, to those who go astray after a lie. Now we got the wise man. You see it, it's all right there too, right? We got the walk, we got secure steps. We got the new song. We, we, we got, we got the, the foolish right here. Don't be foolish. Don't go after a lie. This says that God's not real. Seek God with all your heart. And also waiting patiently, spending time with Him. I love it. Billy Graham was saying that his grandmother told him something about, and there's this station, if you guys got satellite radio, channel 460, it's the Billy Graham station. Switch it to that. It's the best thing on satellite radio. Max told me about it. And he was saying it's those times that you don't hear God. You you feel like you're praying and he's not there. That's, you know, think about the teacher. Is the teacher going to help you on the test? You know, he's not going to stand over there and give you the answers. You know, it seems like he's absent. He is there. But during the test, during the trials, it's that time that you learn to put your faith in him. So let's go back to Ephesians chapter 5. So we see one of the results of being filled with the Spirit. There's three results here that you'll see. The first one is you're going to be filled with a new song. You're going to be filled with a song. You're going to be filled with praise, giving glory to God. You're going to sing it. You don't have to have a good voice. You guys realize you don't have to have a good voice to sing a song? You just got to have a heart after God. You just sing it. You give Him praise. You give Him the glory. And if anyone sits there and gets upset, guess whose heart is wrong in that situation? They need the Spirit, right? And you can witness to them. Share the Lord and tell them to spend their time foolishly. But anyways, verse 20 here. Giving thanks always for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Giving thanks to who? Who do we give thanks to? So if you're filled with the Spirit, what do you do? So we're going to sing a song, but we're also going to give what? Thanks. Now I want you to take a second here and realize how important is it to give thanks when it comes to your marriage? How important is it to give thanks when it comes to your kids and your parents? My dad just talked about that right before he got up here. You know, your parents aren't going to be there forever. You realize that. So when your parents are here, if they were, if they were gone today, would you be missing them and wishing they were back? So when you're filled with the Spirit, you begin to have a thankful lifestyle because God's mercy, because of His grace. Think about this. When your kids are right there, Dad, 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 Dad! And, and, and everything else is going on in the world, and you just get a bad phone call, and it's there, and then something's going on with your parents, and everything's being wrecked. You just got a bill you can't pay, whatever it may be, and everything's going on, and your, and your kids are right there. Spend time with me, and you just don't have the time, and it's right there. Do you realize how important 
Thanksgiving is in that moment. Because it is by God's mercy your kid is with you. It's by God's mercy his heart beats. Her heart beats. Because at any moment, they could be gone. And when you begin to live your life with thanksgiving for them being there, it begins to change your relationship with your wife, with your kids. You know, what if God took your wife away? All those beautiful memories you have is all that's lasted. That's all you got. And now they're gone. And you can't make more with them anymore. So you got to live for today. Make use of the time because the days are evil. That's what Paul's saying. Begin to use our time wisely. Giving thanks always for everything to God. What about your boss? Can you give thanks for them? So there's two things so far. We got the song. We got Thanksgiving. And look at this third one. This is actually probably the most important. The Holy Spirit is going to give you the power for this last one. Verse 21. Submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Is it important to submit? How many of us want to submit? I'm telling you, I've, I, what about churches? Do you think people have a problem submitting in churches today? I, I've heard of churches where it's like the business meeting, you know? You can sit here and talk about spiritual things in the last five minutes, but as soon as they talk about the paint color, that thing goes for hours. You know, we don't, we don't want to submit on things, little things, you know? It's like, why do we have this? Why do we have that? And just, we don't, who gives us the power to submit? God. It's not our flesh. Our flesh is evil. So what do we need to do? We need to spend time with God. We need to get filled with the Spirit. We need to kick out all the filth out of our life so we can be filled with the Spirit. So we can learn to submit. So wives can submit to their husbands. So husbands can love their wives in a submitting way. And so children can obey their parents in a submitting way. So parents can do the same and admit when they're wrong. And, and, and submit to their kids in a way. I mean, of course, we've got to have the authority to some respect. And I'm not saying we've got to be, you know, let them just run right over you. But stopping and thinking about the moment, what's going on, and, and praying about it, and, and submitting and understanding when we're wrong, and being open with our kids. It's the opposite of pride, guys. But we don't submit because we're proud. So the Spirit helps us with those things, puts a song in our heart, brings that joy, gives us thanksgiving, and helps us submit in these relationships. So let me ask you a question. Is the Spirit, do you guys agree, is the Spirit important for those three relationships we talked about? Now, let me ask you another question. Do you think the devil wants success in those three relationships? He does not want you to be successful in your marriage. He does not want you to be successful in your family. He does not want you to be successful in your work relationships. Do you think Paul knew that? When he wrote this letter, do you think he realized that? Because take a look at what he talks about right after these relationships. You know what comes up? The armor of God. Right after he mentions wives do this, husbands do this, parents do this, children do this, the next thing he talks about, we need to put the armor of God on. Because he knows the devil's coming after the family. Do you think the devil's taking the family in America? We see divorce everywhere. We see kids broken. We see all this brokenness of the family. And what's happening is we're not raising the kids in the instruction and discipline of the Lord as we talked about in chapter 6 verse 4. We're not doing those things anymore. As a family, and I'm not saying we necessarily is in the church, but you look across the United States and the family has been under attack. The first institution right there in the Bible, the family under attack. you got to realize the importance of the family. you got to realize the devil wants to take these down. He doesn't want you filled with the Spirit. So what do you think he's going to do? He's going to distract you. He's going to get you drunk with wine. He's going to get you high on marijuana. He's going to get you doing all these other things. Because he doesn't want you... To be blessed in these areas. Because he knows the power of God. And he knows what God can do when the family's going right. And that's why he says right here. Let's just go to chapter 6 verse 10. Let's just read through it real quick. And we'll finish up with some prayer. Finally, be strong. So chapter 6 verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord. We need to be strong in the Lord. And in the strength of whose might? In our might? In his might. So in these same areas, we need the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. I'm telling you, the schemes of the devil, he's coming after you every which way. He's going to attack you in every which way. He's going to try to take your time. 
He's going to try to take your eyes off of your wife. He's going to try to take your eyes off of your husband. He's going to try to take your eyes off of your kids and off of your parents. He's going to try to, to, to cause division. Do you think he's going to try to cause division in these areas? He is. In verse 12, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. I'm telling you guys, we need to be focused on our marriages. We need to be focused on our children. We need to be focused on our parents. We need to focus on our work relationships. God tells us the importance. Paul here is telling us the importance, but are we doing it alone? Who's helping us? By the power of the Spirit inside of you. So what do we need to do? Do we need to spend morning time on getting busy with our schedules? Finding more work to do for more money? Finding more time in sports and athletics and every single else thing. I don't know. These kids get so involved these days at the high school. They're in all the AP classes. They're in FFA. They're in band. They're, they're, they're in chorus. They're in every single thing. Do you think they got time for God? But we do the same thing in our own schedules. We need to get down on our knees and start spending time with God. And stop letting the devil distract us. Amen? And God knows this. And Paul knew this. And that's why he's saying we got to put on the armor daily. When it comes down, because our family, daily, the devil's coming after your kids. The daily the devil's coming after your spouse. We've got to be doing this daily, being filled with the Spirit. Amen? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, just thank you so much for your word, God. I just thank you for, um, for sending your Spirit to help us with that, God. I just pray if anyone here does not have your Spirit inside, a, inside them, that they just... Pray, Lord, that you just come into them, Lord, that you uh, that they put their faith in you, that they put their trust in you, God. And I just pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So as we close, I think.